Good afternoon. Um, welcome to our webcast on supporting the well-being of your team. My name is Anna Young from the Chartered Banker Institute, and today I'm delighted to introduce Colette, who is from Parent Cloud. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the online function to submit these, um, and we'll try to answer as many as possible. We also have a poll, so please do participate in that as well. Uh, I hope you enjoy today's webcast, and I will now hand you over to Colette. Thank you. Um, hello, good afternoon, um, and welcome to today. Uh, so we're going today to be looking at the um, emotional well-being of your staff. Um, so I'm just going to move the slide on. So today we're going to think about emotional well-being um, for those who are working from home, um, how we're impacted by COVID-19, um, how we start discussions with somebody who we feel is struggling to maintain um, healthy well-being whilst avoiding some of the, the common pitfalls that may happen, and how to best support team members um, to maintain that emotional um, well-being. So those are the things that um, we're going to be looking at today. Um, so the first thing I really wanted to, to get people to, to think about and to understand is how our brain operates um, around emotional well-being. It's really, really important that we have a think about this um, because obviously our brain is what is going to drive everything that's going on for us. So when we think about mental health, we, we think about the three parts of the brain, so we divide it into three areas. We have uh, the thinking brain, which is the largest part of the brain and is the, the conscious brain. This is where all our language is processed, uh, decisions get made, uh, sequencing of events. Um, it's where we make sense of the world with everything that we know. So the thinking brain is the part of the brain that should be primarily be in charge of our day-to-day -day living. Uh, the next bit, and this is going to be the crucial bit for, for what we're thinking about today, is the emotional brain. So the, the emotional brain is the, is the bit that deals um, with emotion. It, it sort of works your, um, helps to work your fight or flight um, part. Uh, when it works really, really well, the emotional brain works well. It allows thoughts and emotions to, to flow freely. Um, the systems all get moved around the brain really nicely when it's, when it's working well. Um, and it's obviously an, a, a crucial part of, of the brain. Without this, uh, without this bit of the brain, without us uh, having those links, we would struggle to know when we need to perceive threat. We would struggle to know when something is wrong. So it, it's a crucial part of the brain, but it absolutely should not be leading the, the charge when uh, life is going on. It should just be flowing nicely in the background. The final part of the brain that we need to consider is the survival brain. It's known as the reptilian part of the brain, and that's because it's, the, it's thought to be the first part of the brain that evolved. Um, it is crucial to survival because this is the part of the brain that starts off the, the fight or flight process. This is the bit that helps us, along with the emotional brain, decide when we need to, to perceive threat and then how to manage that situation. So all three bits of the brain are obviously crucial. On the whole, thinking brain should be leading. Survival brain sits alongside it in terms of leading. Emotional brain should never really be leading. When it starts to lead, then we find ourselves in an unhealthy situation. So hopefully that bit makes sense to you. So survival mode. So I just want to have a think about what survival mode is. Um, what it means for us, and then we're going to have to uh, start to think about functional behavior. So the, the thing about survival mode, the thing about the survival part of our brain is that's what helps us to, alongside the emotional brain, helps us to understand that there is some kind of threat. Currently, a lot of people are living in what's called survival mode because the, the virus is is causing us to, to feel like there is constant threat around us. It is crucial, it has to be said, it's absolutely crucial that this part of our brain um, is working for us. 
because that is what, if we don't feel threat as a species, we wouldn't survive. If we didn't recognize there was something wrong, if we didn't recognize with the virus um, that there was a potential threat to, to life with it, we would have no fear of it. We would have just carried on going out and, and, and living life, um, and the fertility, fertility rates would have been significantly higher. If we go right back to caveman days when the survival mode uh, was introduced to our bodies and to evolution, we wouldn't even have survived uh, the caveman days when fight or flight was first thought of, or that's when we take it back to, because when we had uh, when the threat of, of saber-toothed tigers or or any of those things had been placed in front of us, if we didn't feel the fear, then we wouldn't have known to do something about it, and we would have uh, been ruled out as a species. So it is a crucial part of our brain in order for us to survive as a species. It's really important that we're all aware of that, because it's important to know that when we start to feel that fear, that is a normal part of the process. That is what is supposed to happen. It is healthy for us to feel a little bit of fear so that we can manage it. Um, what should happen um, is, is the fight or flight kicks off for us, so we perceive threat. We, we go into what's called fight or flight mode, um, and then very, very quickly, we should move from fight or flight mode, which happens with the emotional brain, into uh, deciding what we're going to do, which is where the thinking brain comes back in to lead the charge, and, and the thinking brain enables us to decide which of those options we're going to go for. Currently, my sense is that a lot of people are living in this survival mode, um, especially um, or including those who are working remotely and including those who are having to, to go into work um, in, in buildings. Certainly, what I have seen with Boris Johnson's recent announcement is an increase in anxiety in terms of not understanding what is going on. Part of that is because we're feeling that fear. So um, in terms of where we're at with survival mode, working remotely, um, we're looking at people who are struggling, who are having increased anxiety due to things such as um, isolation, feeling trapped, feeling really overwhelmed by the new roles that are being placed upon them, not necessarily by employers, but um, I suddenly find myself being um, a, a worker, um, a teacher, back to being a mum, to doing stuff around the house, to to, to doing all of the things that I would normally do, but I've certainly got new roles that are being introduced to me and finding that I've got less time, and it can feel very overwhelming um, for me. Um, and then we sometimes get into a place of panic, and, and we start to feel very strong anxiety um, kicking in, um, almost leading to uh, potential panic attacks or certainly very heightened um, anxiety, and we know that if we've got heightened anxiety, so again, what I'm seeing an increase in is depressive type behaviors. Um, that sense of feeling trapped, the, the anxiety that is kicking in is, is leading to further mental health complications, um, such as depression. So we need to be really mindful that all of that comes from that place of living in survival mode. Um, and, and how we manage survival mode is then key. So how do we know that we're living in survival mode as employers or as people who are supporting um, other employees? How do we know that somebody might be in that place? How do we know that somebody might be struggling with their emotional well-being? One of the, the first things that we can have a think about or one of the, the first things that we might want to observe will be behavior. So we start looking for um, different behaviors um, in the people that we're working with that work for us, in family members, in children, in, in anybody that we're communicating with. We start looking at behavior and we start thinking about um, whether that behavior is now functional. So when we talk about functional behavior, 
what we're starting to think about is behavior as a form of communication. Um, there are a couple of functions of behavior. Um, primarily the ones I think we would be looking at now might be avoidance and or escape. Um, and so what we might be seeing happening is maybe um, people are starting to isolate or becoming a little bit quieter, not communicating in maybe the ways they might have communicated before, um, maybe getting frustrated, maybe being a little bit shorter in responses, um, just something that is different to what you have observed from that person before. Um, and that, that avoidance, that escape might be around talking about work in general. It might be if you're trying to have conversations with somebody about some family stuff or some personal stuff, there might be a lot of um, escape, um, a lot of um, shutdown, a lot of um, maybe some anger, some frustration, maybe some sarcasm. So, so we're looking for communications or behaviors that you don't recognize in that person as general. If they're generally a little bit of a, an angry person or a bit of a frustrated person and they nearly always give short answers, if you're seeing that and you're not seeing anything new, then we're not talking about functional behavior there. It's when you see a behavior you don't recognize in, in that person, when you're seeing something different. So behavior becomes a form of communication. So we need to then start uh, listening to the behavior rather than watching it. When we're listening to behaviors, then we can be really proactive in terms of how we manage it. If we're watching behaviors, then we are likely to be much more reactive in terms of, of what we're seeing. So in terms of how do we start to notice that somebody might be living in um, heightened um, emotional ill-being, one of the, the first things that we can look at, especially because for some of us, we're not seeing these people face to face. We're not able to pick up on some of the body language maybe we would have picked up on before. So we need to start paying attention to how they're communicating with us. We start looking at, at their functional behavior. So hopefully all of this makes sense. If it's not making any sense, then please, please, do put a question up and, and we can have a look and, and I can hopefully answer it for you. So if we're thinking about behavior as a, as a way of communication when we're supporting staff, I just need to move the slide on, um, then one of the things that we, we really need to think about is how we are communicating with, um, with people and how they're communicating back towards us. Um, and so when we're doing that, we can consider what's called Cartman's Drama Triangle. So I, I don't know how many people um, are aware of this. Um, certainly the people that I work with um, have had no awareness of it until I've spoken to them. But it is a key tool when we are thinking about communication with people. Um, and actually we can use this as a key tool when somebody has very good well-being as, as much as when, they, when they're not feeling so well from a, a mental point of view. Uh, so there are three roles within the, the drama triangle that we look at. Um, we have the persecutor, um, and so the persecutor role is one who may be slightly aggressive, may be a little bit judgmental, um, and has the mindset of you are not okay or you are wrong. So that is the, the persecutor role. We also have the rescuer role. Um, and so the rescuer role is one of somebody who believes the person needs uh, to be fixed. So they need somebody to do something for them. So the rescuer is very much about saying, you're not okay without me helping you. Um, and then we have the, the victim role and the victim role is, is very much one of um, I'm helpless or I'm not okay. Um, I need to be really clear here, we're, we're talking about mindset, so this is about a mindset thing, um, and if you're talking, if you're having conversations with, with somebody and you're thinking about the drama triangle, it's not about labeling somebody and saying well you're being a persecutor now or, or you're being a victim, it is about having awareness of those roles 
so that you can maintain a conversation without falling into it. So um, certainly a lot of the people that I'm working with currently are falling into a victim mindset. They're feeling very out of control of the situation. They're, they're feeling very unsure, very uncertain, very much in a I'm not okay place. Um, and so I have to be really mindful in terms of how I respond to that. It is not my job to tell them that they are not okay or that they are wrong. If somebody is saying to me, I don't feel safe in, in the world today, it is not my job to say, um, you're wrong, the world is still safe, or, or you're right, you're not okay, the world is, is not safe. Um, because that puts me into a persecutor role, but more importantly, it keeps the person I'm talking to in, in a victim mindset. And what I want to be able to do is pull that person out of victim mindset. So I don't want to be the persecutor. But equally, I don't want to rescue. I don't want the person I'm speaking to to think that they're not able to work this out for themselves, that they need to be fixed, that they need rescuing. Because again, if I do that, if I rescue somebody, what I am saying is, um, what I'm doing rather is enabling that person to stay in the victim mindset. I'm not giving them opportunity to pull out of it themselves. One of the things we think about with the drama triangle is um, something called transactional analysis, and people may be more aware of transactional analysis, where we have the three roles of parent, adult, child. So the parent would be the persecutor or the rescuer. A persecutor would be a critical parent. Rescuer would be a nurturing parent. And the victim would be the child. Um, and in terms of how you communicate with somebody, if one of you is being a parent, whether it's a persecutor or a rescuer, whether it's a critical or a nurturing parent, the other person has no option but to be in child role. What we want within these conversations is for everybody to stay adult. It is okay for somebody to say, I'm struggling at the moment. I'm, I'm not feeling very safe with how the world is at the moment. I'm struggling with working at home because I'm not getting the interaction I would normally get from people. I don't understand what people are asking. Or it's okay for people to do that. It doesn't make them, uh, they don't have to be a victim. We can help to pull them out of that situation. And we do that by staying in an adult role. Sometimes within the drama triangle, it's worth bearing in mind that somebody is already in role and they try and pull you into one of the other roles. So if somebody is feeling particularly helpless and very much in a I'm not okay place, um, if they are looking for somebody to make it better for them, they may work to put you into one of the other roles. It is crucial in those moments that you stay out of one of those roles and remain in the adult place. In terms of communication, in terms of how we're, we're working with people, in terms of trying to pull people out of that survival mode we were talking about just now, we need for them to feel enabled to do that by themselves with support. We're not rescuing. We're not telling anybody that they're not okay. But we can absolutely support these people so that they are able to pull themselves out of that, that mindset by themselves. Uh, so we'll move on to, to the next slide. So we're just going to have um, a little bit of a, a think about some of the common pitfalls that we might fall into. And actually, when we're thinking about these pitfalls, we can think about where we are in terms of are we in persecutor role or are we in, in rescuer role. Um, so potentially, if we say to somebody, don't worry. Um, what we're doing is we're either going to persecutor because we're potentially judging somebody for worrying about something, um, or we're trying to go into rescuer because we're trying to fix it for them. Um, but actually, what does don't worry mean? What does it'll be okay mean? What does so many things have happened to you mean? All of these common fit pitfalls allow somebody to remain in victim mindset. Um, 
when we say, let me fix it for you, or I know exactly how you feel, we don't know exactly how they feel. We have our interpretation of how they might be feeling, but we don't know exactly how they feel, and we certainly can't fix this for them. Because if we do, if, if we do any of these things, they get to stay in that victim mindset. And we know when they're in victim mindset, we know that they, they remain in survival mode, um, and therefore their emotional well-being continues to stay in an unhealthy place. Some of those statements as well, so I suffered with anxiety myself in my early 20s, um, and I know that if somebody um, or people did say to me, don't worry, it'll be okay, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to work this out, you'll be fine, it, it just was really unhelpful to me. It either made me feel really, really cross, or it made me want to isolate from people. So it's really important when we're thinking about how we're communicating with, with staff, when we're communicating with employees, but equally when we're communicating with family members or, or friends, that we really have to think about where are we going with our conversations with these people. If they're letting me know by behavior that they're really struggling, if I'm working really hard not to fall into the drama triangle, then where am I, how am I going to respond to these people, how am I going to have these communications so that it feels like um, an okay place for them and an okay place for me. And I think it's also worth pointing out um, whatever your role, whether you are an employee, whether you are managing somebody, whether you are a director, a CEO, whether you're a mum or a dad or a friend or whoever you are, it's worth pointing out that you are going through some of this yourself. I am certainly going through this myself. I have days where I feel absolutely fine. I equally have days where it, it, I feel quite overwhelmed and, and I feel quite sad and, and confused and frustrated. Um, so I think it's really important that within all of this, in terms of, of how we're managing we remember we're going through these things ourselves. And actually, that makes it harder sometimes to deal with or to manage somebody else. We are in our own survival mode. When we're in survival mode and we're working with somebody in survival mode, we're both coming from a place that is not necessarily helpful to a good conclusion. Um, I'm hoping this is all making sense. Uh, there are no questions so far, so I'm hoping this is all making sense. So let's just have a, a think maybe about what might be useful. So one of the things that, that I would be saying is, is be curious. So keep it in an adult place. So maybe some of the terminology I've, I've used here. Um, when I'm working with clients, I do a lot of wondering because that's not me saying to somebody, I can see this is how you're feeling, or I'm assuming this is how you're feeling, or you're, you don't need to worry about that, that's somebody else's job to worry about. But actually, if I'm wondering about something, it's making me curious, and it encourages somebody to, to respond to, it encourages somebody to, to talk back. So in terms of how to, to support your employees, um, and especially because communication is, or, or talking may be all you've got, especially if they're working um, from home, so you're not having the contact that you would normally have. You're not able to pick up off some of the cues you might normally pick up off. If all you've got is verbal, some of these are a really good starter in terms of conversation. So I've noticed. And I've noticed that sometimes um, when we're talking, um, you're not giving as, as much as you might normally give. So I'm, I'm just wondering, is, is everything okay? Is there anything I can help? Is there any support you need? So it, it's just that, just be curious. Um, help me understand. So again, this takes us away from the assumption that we know what somebody is going through. So help me understand. And if they're able to verbalize what is going on for them, if they're able to really tell you um, and they're thinking about sort of worst case scenarios or they're looking at worst case scenarios, then we want them to, to try and go forward with it. So what would that look like? And then what does that mean? And what does that mean? And how does that feel? So we, we just get them to explore a little bit. 
that being curious is a really nice way of having conversations with employees, with family members, with friends, with whoever you're going to do that with, with children. It's being curious is a really good way of, of starting those conversations and communication, but keeping yourself out of that drama triangle. So you're keeping it on an adult, adult level. Nobody needs to be the parent or nobody needs to be the child. Even if you literally are a parent talking to a child, you keep it on a certain level so that nobody needs to be in one of those drama triangle roles. Um, and language. So again, you may or may not be able to, to see um, what's going on for a person, especially if you're communicating through um, an online stream. Um, but we can we can check with what somebody is saying. We can make sure we've got what they're saying and that we've not misinterpreted what they're saying. Um, so check what it is somebody is saying to you versus what you think they are saying. As, as a counsellor, I have to. I do this quite a lot because I can just assume I've understood something, and, and on more than one occasion, I've got it completely wrong. Body language. If you are able to see any part of their body, and even if you can only see their face, um, you are going to be able to pick up on some elements of body language. But don't assume you're reading it correctly, or that they're reading yours correctly. Um, Working online has been really interesting for me. Um, clients are saying to me, oh, you can't see the things you would normally see. You can't see my leg shaking like you would normally see. Actually, I'm really honest with them and say, you're right, I can't, but I can see your face. And your face tells me all I need to know. Um, so, so you will still be able to pick up on some cues in terms of body language, potentially showing us something different to what is coming out of mouth but we mustn't assume that we're reading it correctly. We still need to check in. We still need to be curious about what's going on because, again, that is what is going to enable us to have those, those good conversations with nobody falling into, into the drama triangle roles. Um, and then listen. So make sure that we're, we're reflecting back what it is that has been said to us. Um, and you'll know all of this, I'm sure, from active listening, but... We need to make sure that we're listening. We need to make sure we reflect back to make sure we've heard accurately. And then we continue to be curious, to get a bit more information from somebody who is struggling with their well-being. We need to keep being curious because we need them to keep enlightening us with what's going on, but in a non-judgmental way. And so being curious is a really nice way to, to be able to do that. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, I've had a couple, a couple questions come in, if you don't mind. Of course. Um, what would you do if a team member is really showing all the signs of a mental health issue but is refusing to acknowledge that anything's wrong? So I think some of the, the things that I would say, one of the things I would say, and, and I'm not sure that I have spoken about it today actually, is one of the first things I would want to be really clear on with, with anybody is that emotion is okay. Um, so sometimes the, the not acknowledging what is going on for them is because they don't have that understanding that it is okay to, to have emotion. It is okay to um, feel nervous or to feel sad or to feel frustrated or to feel happy. So, so I really want to be encouraging emotion um, and allowing people to know it's okay, it's safe to show emotion, um, and if it's safe to show emotion, we're more likely to, to talk about what's going on for us. But then I would go back to what I've said. So uh, I would be really curious with them. I'd, I'd give them space and a bit of time. Um, it, it takes a long time, or it can take a long time for somebody to acknowledge for themselves that they are struggling. Sometimes they don't even notice that they're struggling. We've noticed because their behavior is telling us, but they're not noticing what's going on for them. So give a little bit of space and a little bit of time to see if they can acknowledge that for themselves. But I would be curious I, and, and get them to feel comfortable in terms of sharing. So do that wondering stuff. Be curious about what the change in behavior is 
is about. And, and I think it's okay to point out to somebody, normally when we talk, this is what it looks like. So I'm just wondering what's changed. I'm just wondering if, if something has happened, that means you're, you're talking in a slightly different way. Um, and if once they feel comfortable enough to share what is going on for them, I would go back to reassuring them that emotion is okay. It's absolutely okay and is always a natural response to a situation. The heightened anxiety we are seeing at the moment from a lot of people, whether that's people working from home, whether that's people out and about, is a natural response. It's the way the brain is supposed to work. It is supposed to make us feel worried about what is going on. We have to feel that fear to know that this is a different situation. But then what we need to happen is for our thinking brain to kick in and to support us and to allow the, the logic that we need to make sense of the situation to happen. So mm -hmm. I, would, I would be curious with them. I'd give them a bit of space if it was needed. I'd reassure that emotion is okay and remind that it's a natural response to a situation and is, is being seen quite widely across I think the world at the moment, I don't think it's just the UK, I think the world is seeing it at the moment. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and also one, one person said, I've seen a variety of different articles about the effect of lockdown on employees. Some have said they feel there are considerably more absence due to mental health issues even after things start to return to normal. Others have suggested an increase in team morale due to increased flexibility. Uh, what, do you have an opinion on that? Sorry, could you just repeat that? I didn't hear all of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Sorry. So I've seen a, a variety of different articles um, about the impact of lockdown on employees. Um, some have said they feel there will be a considerably more absence due to mental health issues um, after things start to return to normal. Um, and will there be an in, increase in, some have suggested an increase in team morale um, due to increased flexibility. Um, what are your thoughts on that? So, yeah, I, I, think, I, I think it's really interesting. I think everybody is trying to, to figure out what is going on at the moment. And I think there will, I think there are, are people who are going to be really struggling with mental health at the moment, even once things return to normal. And part of that will be because normal will possibly look different. Um, so I think there is going to be an increase um, potentially of, of mental health concerns and therefore an increase um, in absence due to mental health. Mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing that a lot in, in people I'm working with. Um, so I absolutely agree. I think, and I think part of what needs to, to happen is we need to start encouraging people to believe that the world is a, a safe place or it's as safe as we can make it. Mm -hmm. At the moment, people are hypervigilant, and, and their own thoughts and feelings are changing. And then once they change and once they stay in that place, they remain in place. So belief systems start to change. Um, and, and people who even have been previously emotionally well are going to find themselves in situations causing mental health concerns. Um, and therefore, I would agree, potentially, we will see more absence, and that is going to need to be managed. Equally, I think there are a group of people who see this as a great opportunity to do something different, um, to introduce things that maybe they've been wanting to introduce before and, and haven't for whatever reason, maybe work pressures. So equally, I think there are going to be people who are going to see this as an exciting opportunity to change what is going on for them in, in their workspace and to provide different resources. Um, so. I think there are two very different types of people. I think there are those who are very much living in that survival mode, very fearful of what's going on, and mental health is going to be very present for those people. I think there is a whole host of other people who probably potentially feel quite excited about some of the changes that they are now going to be able to, to put into place. Mm -hmm. um, my fear is that the, the increase in mental health is going to be significantly higher than those who are excited about what the future might bring. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And just one more, is that do you think some of the mental health issues that may arise during this period of lockdown will have a long-lasting impact on people? 
I think it depends on what support is put into place for those people. Mm -hmm. I think if we can acknowledge that um, mental health issues have risen during this period of time as employers, if we can acknowledge that, if we can start to put things into place now, so even before, um, I know Mr. Johnson has said that people can go back to work, but there are still a large number of people who are going to have to work from home or maybe can't work at all at the moment. Mm -hmm. I think if we can start to put support structures in place now, if we can think about opening communication with people now, working really hard to keep that drama triangle in mind so we're not putting people into a victim mindset place so that they don't feel that they need rescuing, um, then I think it doesn't have to have a long-term impact. I think the, the impact on people is very much going to depend on the response of those who employ and who are involved with um, those people who are going to struggle. It has the potential to have a very long-lasting impact on people. With the right support in place, I think it will be okay. Thank you. I've just got one, actually, one more, actually. Obviously, thank you to all those who participated in the poll. Um, and a few, 33% are not sure if their team's mental health has had an impact during this time. Do you have any tips for, rec for perhaps approaching those conversations or recognizing um, if, they're, if, if they're unsure of how their team's mental health are rather than just asking them? I think I would say it will, it will be about um, being, um, I very nearly said alert, which is of course the, the new camera, <laughs> alert. Um, I think it is, it, it's about being um, observant of what is going on. We know when something isn't quite right. We, we um, are, most of us are very blessed to have a good theory of mind, and a good theory of mind means that we are able to look at situations, um, read how people are thinking and or feeling, um, and react accordingly in that situation. Um, and so I think we need to be observant. We need to give a little bit of time. Um, certainly when I had my anxiety, I didn't want people jumping on me all the time, asking what was wrong and, and what they could do. And, and for a long time, I didn't, even, I, I didn't want to talk about it. So I think, I think it is just to do a bit of reflective, reflective observation um, be alert to, to what you're seeing. Really think about the behavior of the people that you're, of your team members. Really think about what it is they're showing you versus what maybe they have shown you before. Um, and then I think it goes back to being curious again. And, and we absolutely don't start the conversation by saying it appears that you're overly anxious about something or it appears mm -hmm. that you're you know, we just start a very generic conversation, um, but we're really curious within that conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, brilliant. That's all the questions. Um, thank you for everyone who's been listening. Um, we've got another pet webcast next week with Parent Health, so feel free to register that as well. And thank you to Colette for presenting. Thank you. Thank you.